Has your doctor recommended that you start statin therapy? Well, if he has, there's a lot of questions you need to ask and more importantly, a lot of answers you need to understand before you make your decision. That's what this video is about. Stay tuned. So you have a decision to make. Well, for the first time in the history of this channel, I'm actually going to give out a reading assignment. So two short articles and well worth your time. The first one is entitled, What's in a Number, Risk, Thresholds, and Different Statin Guidelines? And that's a paper written by two doctors at the University of Washington, Dr. Christopher Wong and Dr. Lisa Inway. And in it, they discuss the use of risk thresholds for initiating statin therapies and how it's different in all different standards of care. They talk about how population statistics really don't apply to individuals, and they talk about an individual's values being important in the decision. If you've been watching my channel for any amount of time, you know that these are three of the many different items that I actually push a lot on. The next one is actually a handbook, I guess, that's put out by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. That's a U.S. government agency, and it's the handbook is Strategies for Improving Patient Experience with Ambulatory Care. I'm interested mostly in Section 6i, which is on shared decision making. Although patients are far more informed about their care than they were even 20 or 30 years ago, some people express frustration and dissatisfaction because they do not feel like they have adequate, if any, input into the decisions that clinicians are making about their health and their lives. I like actually reading the context or the assumptions behind any statement like that. The assumption is that the clinicians are making the decisions and people are allowing them to and being frustrated if they don't have enough input, but even if they did have enough input, the decision would still be made by the clinician. That's sort of implied by this. All decisions involving drug therapy really should be shared between the patient and the doctor. And by that I mean either party has veto power. You can say no to any drug therapy if you don't think it's appropriate for you. And your doctor is also obligated to say no to you. If you went to them and said, hey doc, I saw this commercial on TV, there's a lady dancing on a fountain, I want that drug. If it's not called for, your doctor is obligated to say no. The doctor is not gonna write a prescription for you, and that's as it should be. The point is, you both have to agree it's gotta be unanimous before you submit to any drug therapy or take any medications. We're gonna go over a series of questions that you really need to ask your doctor. This first one is really kind of easy to dispense with. I did a video on it earlier, and that is, do I really have familial hypercholesterolemia? Only in concern if your doctor has told you that you have this condition, which I'll call FH from here on. There are ways of at least arming yourself. Watch my other video if you think this will be helpful to you. I would use the Dutch diagnostic criteria because it's kind of thorough, but easy enough to do. Just as a check to make sure that you understand why your doctor tells you you have FH. You just can't accept high cholesterol runs in your family. Your father had it. You have it, so therefore you have FH. That's just not a diagnosis of FH. FH is a serious genetic condition, and it may really call for some drastic therapies in order to get the cholesterol down a bit, because we're talking about extremely high levels, 400s, 500s, that sort of thing. So for most of us, these are the questions that we're going to want to ask. First of all, doc, what's my risk? Why are you telling me that I need this therapy? What is my heart attack risk? And there's a bunch of online calculators. I've listed five here, and there will be links to them in the description. And I really think you should go in and plug in your numbers. It doesn't take a lot of different values. The Reynolds risk score takes a high sensitivity C-reactive protein value. So if you have that, you can use that one. The rest of them just use standards such as your total cholesterol and HDL. None of them ask for triglycerides, which baffles me. The MESA one, which is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, will ask for a CAC one. But if you don't have a CAC score, that's a coronary artery calcium score, you can just put in a zero. It'll give you a number that's probably lower than it really is, but it'll also tell you, but if you didn't have a CAC score, this would be the number. That's the one you want to pay attention to. Interesting thing about all these, they'll all give you different numbers. And in studies that I've read, the most accurate one is the 2018 pooled cohort equation. And the least accurate one seems to be the 2013 pooled cohort equation. By coincidence, maybe, the most accurate one gives you the lowest number. The least accurate one gives you the highest number in most cases. So I go with the 2018 PCE one until I get a CAC score, and not just because it gives me the lowest number, but it's because it's the one that the studies have shown is the most accurate. So I took my numbers as an example, and I put them into each of these calculators. I'm age 65, and you can see the values range across here. That MESA score is the one without the CAC score, because I don't have that yet. I'm going with the 6.8% risk. This is a 10-year risk of a cardiovascular event. You may think that's high. 
I don't think it's particularly high. That's what, one out of 16, one out of 15, something like that. That's something I'm gonna live with because I'm doing other things to lower my cardiovascular risk. So just to show you another application of this, I heard of a teenage male athlete who's in a cardiovascularly intensive sport, teenage, probably 15, somewhere 15 to 18. With these numbers, these are the only numbers that I actually heard about because this was like really secondhand. I went to use these numbers and I put them into the calculators. Now the calculators generally don't go, they definitely don't go down to the teenage years. One of them, the 2018 PCE will go down to 20, but most of them go down to 40 or 45. So I just said, well, suppose a 45 year old had these values. And I plug them in and you can see that these values are quite low. They're lower even than mine. I believe the reason is the HDL is very good here and that's considered very protective by all these calculators. So this particular person, even if they were 45, would be well protected and their risk would be very low. I did put a 20, because I could put it into 2018, I did put a 20 year old in there and the value was like less than 1%. I think it was less than a half a percent. This person's doctor has been telling the parents maybe you should be on statin therapy. Still may be appropriate because as we go on we'll see there may be other reasons but just based on these numbers alone I personally don't think it's appropriate especially if the kid's a teenager let them become an adult and make that decision. They're, they're unlikely to have a heart attack in the next 10 years if it's less than a quarter of a percent and that's not two and a half percent it's a quarter of a percent so like a one in 400 chance. So let the person mature leave them alone that would be my non-medical opinion it's not medical advice and there may be other considerations. Next thing to ask is, well, what's my risk reduction, my absolute risk reduction I'm gonna get from taking this treatment if I decide to take it, and what's the number needed to treat? These will become clearer if you haven't heard of these before. So first, we're gonna go through an alphabet soup, of mostly R's actually. So I'm gonna use a relative risk reduction of 36%, and I get that from the famous Lipitor ad. Most of the studies have shown the relative risk reduction of using a statin is around this value. Sometimes they're lower, sometimes it's higher. Good value to use here. Now just be aware, doesn't mean that you had a 40% risk and it got cut to 4%. No, in their study, 3% of the people in a control group had cardiovascular events, and only 1.9% of the people in the treated group had that. Well, that 1.1% difference is 36% of 3%. So there's a little bit of statistical magic being pulled in there to make this number seem very good. Nevertheless, what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out an absolute risk reduction for an individual, and I'm gonna do it for me. I'm gonna take this 36% risk reduction, I'm gonna multiply it by my absolute risk, which is the number I was getting from those calculators, and I end up with a risk reduction of about 2.5%. Now, there is an assumption here, and it is an extrapolation to say that, well, the relative risk reduction that was discovered on a group of people with a 3% risk, my definition, they had a 3% risk, that's the number of heart attacks they had in the control group, and that it applies across all risk levels. Don't know if that's true or not, but for at least the starting point of argument, We'll just accept it as true and see what we're getting here. So 2.5% risk reduction for me. My treated risk, in other words, the risk that's remaining after this treatment is just the difference between the two, and I still have a 4.3% risk of a heart attack over the next 10 years. The number needed to treat is the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So in my case, it's one over that 2.5%, which tells me that if we had a group of 40 people who were exactly like me, and we all took statins for 10 years, we would avoid a single heart attack. Just something to keep in mind to give you an order of magnitude, give you an idea of what you're actually being treated and what your benefit is actually gonna be. If you're interested in this whole idea of the absolute risk reduction versus the relative risk reduction, I have a video devoted just to that and I'll leave a link to that or you can click on the little info card up in the corner here. Next thing to understand is, well, what is driving your risk? Why is your risk what the doctor thinks it is? These first three factors are weighted the most by all the risk calculators. There's a universal thing that's common amongst all these risk calculators and that is smoking, whether you have type two diabetes or whether you have hypertension, high blood pressure. You notice they don't see anything about cholesterol in here in these top three. Those are the three things, and if you are a smoker, well then, as you can imagine, quitting would help you. The next two on the list are the coronary artery calcium score. If it's known, only pertains to one of the calculators. Finally, your cholesterol levels come into play here. So these are the risk factors. And you can verify what fixing any one of them will do by just changing the numbers in the calculator. Say, hey, you know, I have high blood pressure. My goal is to naturally reduce my stress and get my blood pressure down to this. How much will that help my heart risk? I'm gonna quit smoking. How much is that gonna reduce my heart risk? On the smoking thing, be aware though, it's not like, oh, I quit smoking, so the next day your risk is that much lower. It's gonna take a while for you to accumulate that benefit, but it'll at least be a start. 
So this is how you can actually see how these risk factors work into it. What I saw was that high blood pressure has far more impact on you than high cholesterol levels to the point where cholesterol levels are almost lost in the weeds there. So then you can ask, okay, given these risk factors, what lifestyle changes can I make? Well, obviously if you're smoking, you should quit. I mean, that is the biggest risk out of all of these. If you have type 2 diabetes, a low carbohydrate diet will probably help that. There is a YouTube channel run by Dennis Pollock. He's very good. He's a much better communicator than I am called Beat Diabetes. And if you do have type 2 diabetes and you're not already familiar with his channel, I recommend that you go take a look at that to look for advice for how to relieve, put into remission, cure, I don't know what you want to call it, but to actually make your type 2 diabetes better, less type 2 diabetes like, I guess. High blood pressure is a big problem and stress reduction techniques can probably help this. Just be aware that this one's very volatile. The value you get in your doctor's office really doesn't count for much. Ken Berry has a good video on how to properly take your blood pressure. You should relax, make sure you've gone to the bathroom and everything. And as you can see, I have a blood pressure cuff back here. I take my blood pressure all the time and it remains very low. There are times in the past where it shot up, but uh, I've taken care of those issues. Cholesterol quality and quantity, well, diet and exercise can address those. I found that extreme exercise had a considerable impact on my both my quality and the quantity. There are some dietary changes you can make that will lower your cholesterol, but will make your type 2 diabetes, if you have it, worse. By the way, statins will do that too. And sometimes these things do seem to work across purposes. In my mind, my choice is a diet that's going to reduce diabetes and, as in my case, pretty much leave the quantity alone but improve the quality, that's the way I'm going. There are some people who respond poorly, so to speak, to a low carbohydrate diet when it comes to cholesterol. It sends their cholesterol way up. Studies are still underway trying to determine whether that's actually a bad thing for those individuals. And the jury's still out on that. And I look forward to seeing those results when they're available. So then you wanna ask, well, what are the adverse effects? And this one is almost a test of your doctor's familiarity or honesty about adverse effects. If your doctor tells you it's one in 10,000, then that doctor is referring to severe life-threatening adverse effects such as rhabdomyolysis or necrotizing myositis. My response to them would be, no doc, I'm not talking about the things that are gonna kill me. I'm talking about the things that are gonna make my life miserable also. And if they insist, no, this is the only problem, then, well, I got the red X next to that doctor. I would just get a new doctor. If the doctor gives you a number that's less than 6%, they might not actually say 1%, 2%. They may say that's one out of 50. It's one in 100 people. Uh, that's a doctor who's woefully missing informed on statins and isn't paying attention. I just wouldn't want to deal with that doctor either. Doctor that gives you a number of six to 10%, they might actually say, oh, well, it's six to 10%. They're at least reading the literature and the pro-statin literature, even they admit that statin intolerance is in this range. So at least you've got a doctor who's doing more than just being in denial. So I give him a yellow blank box saying, yeah, I might work with that doctor after a serious discussion. If your doctor gives you a more realistic number, like between 11% and 30%, which they may word is well, about a quarter of my patients, something of that sort, which would be 25%, well, then they're aware of the adverse effects and they have experience with them and they understand that they really exist. If your doctor launches into a discussion of the nocebo effect and says, oh, all these statin adverse effects are in people's heads, well, that's another doctor that I'm gonna run away from very quickly because they're clearly uninformed or being stubborn or insisting that, that the world isn't what it is. So you might wanna ask your doctor, well, what other considerations are there? Did you just look at my top line, bottom line, whatever you wanna call it, cholesterol number and say, oh, it's 250, you have to be on a statin? Or did you really look at something in more detail? Ask, are there other considerations? Have they done a deep dive into these items? The items in green are the ones that I've actually taken so far. I'm still trying to range for a CAC score. That's the top one there. And the ones in yellow are the ones I haven't done yet. Carotid intimate media thickness test. I've talked about that before. That actually looks for soft plaque buildup in your carotid artery. That's probably the most important one out of all of these. You can get a measured LDL versus the one that's normally calculated and they calculate it by just taking your trigs over five and saying that's your remnant cholesterol and then subtracting that plus the HDL off the total and that gives you an approximation of your LDL. The one time I did take a measured LDL cholesterol, it was very close to the calculated one. So for my numbers, I just go with the calculated one. You can also get an LDL particle test. I had a lot of trouble getting that because the lab didn't understand what it was and they just did the calculated one twice. I tried calling up the lab. They refused to discuss it with me. They basically lied to me and said that they didn't have the results yet. They never had the results and my doctor couldn't get them out of them. And if they'd made it, told me, oh, we made a mistake, 
I would have just gone back in and given them blood. That would have been fine, you know, and they could have done the test, but I don't use that lab anymore. LP little a, mine is actually very good. Uh, that's just another type of LDL, because it's, so it's differentiating some more. Uh, numbers that are a high percentage of your actual LDL, that's troublesome. Um, APOB, I haven't looked into too much yet, but I'll be asking my doctor about that. I did take a stress test many years ago, but you do have to be aware of false negatives there. The most famous example I can think of is Tim Russert. He passed the stress test is the way they put it, and a few weeks later he died of a heart attack. So you've got to be careful with stress tests. C-reactive protein or high sensitivity C-reactive protein, that's a measure of inflammation. It's another important one of mine have a tendency to be very low. I've never had a fractionation test yet. There's a pattern A and a pattern B and that just tells you like the quality of the LDL. Oxidized LDL is a bad thing and I think it gets reflected in these other tests. The ankle brachial index is interesting. That is actually taking your blood pressure on your arm and on your ankles and Dr. Ford Brewer on his YouTube channel explains that one. I went ahead and did that. That's actually why I bought this blood pressure cuff and I found my index fits in perfectly normal, you know, perfectly healthy. And then there's computerized tomography angiogram. Uh, that's another test that can be taken. Uh, there is a book by Dr. Brewer uh, called Prevention Myths that will give you a lot of good information on that. So what's the bottom line here? Well, first you need to be well informed and I hope this video helps you become well informed and have the right questions to ask of your doctor. Secondly, use this information that you gain from doing the homework exercises and the risk calculations and everything to understand and decide rather than challenge your doctor. Don't go into your doctor with the attitude that, doc, you're wrong. You're like, hey, hey doctor, I just wanna understand like what is your risk? Cause I wanna make sure we're on the same page. We may agree that the risk is a certain amount, but I may think that that's not a high enough risk for me to forego lifestyle changes first before anything else. Keep that kind of positive, cooperative attitude between you and your doctor, and I think you'll go a long way to actually making a valid decision. Your decision may actually be to take the statin, or it may be that you both agree not to take the statin, or if you have to, you use your veto power and say, no, I'm not taking the statin, if that's what your decision is. Be aware that your risk is often lower than you'd think by your doctor's reaction. I've told the story before about my doctor when she saw my cholesterol test, this was a doctor I no longer use, was in an absolute panic and I discovered that at that time, by today's standards, my risk factor was very low and statins were only gonna do a tiny bit to lower it from there. So it was ridiculous. Don't just go by your doctor's reaction to a single cholesterol test, for example. Finally, though, after you've thought about it, just go by your gut feel, using this information as an input to your gut, I suppose is the way to put it, and follow your instincts. Be comfortable with it. Continue to learn, continue to understand things. If you're still concerned, ask for some of these tests, the CIMT or the CAC. I'm gonna to continue to learn and I hope we all continue to learn. So that's the information I have on the things you really wanna find out from your doctor if they recommend statin therapy for you. So if you appreciate this content, please like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you'll always know when I put up something new. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.